Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 203 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about whether animals have an afterlife. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Most children have had the experience of loving a pet, and when a beloved dog or cat passes on, the child grieves at the thought of never seeing the pet again. A common question the children have is whether they will see their pets again in heaven. In some circles, a common opinion is that they won't, that animals don't have an afterlife. But is that really true? How good are the arguments used for that position, and is there any evidence that animals do, in fact, survive death? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, do you have a personal connection to this topic? Like lots of people, I grew up with pets, and I have fond memories of them. My parents uh, preferred us to have lower-maintenance animals like cats and fish, so we mostly had those. At one point, I also kept wild box turtles that I'd caught and then trained to eat out of my hands. When they were hungry, they would crawl up and then gently, gently bite on my fingers to let me know they wanted me to give them food. But at one point, we had a dog, which I named Zachron, and I really loved that dog, and I cried unbearably when it had to be put to sleep. But I've never seen the ghosts of any pets we have, so I haven't had that experience. But recently, I was in an online discussion with one of my professors from the Rhine Education Center, and one of the classes I took with him was on skepticism and parapsychology, or how to apply critical thinking to claims of the paranormal. In the class, we talked a good bit about the bogus electronic devices that you can find on Amazon that are supposed to let you detect and interact with ghosts. These are actually devices that were designed for completely different purposes, but ghost hucksters have redressed them and put them in new packaging and jacked up the prices to sell them as ghost hunting devices and make money. One of the devices is actually a cat toy that you can buy for like $2. It's a little ball that lights up when the cat bats it around and plays with it, but the hucksters have redressed it and claimed that it responds to ghosts. In an online chat, my professor uh, jokingly suggested that maybe it would work if it were the ghost of a cat, and someone said, or a dog. And then I said, well, if you were working with a ghost dog, you should actually throw the electronic device and see if the ghost retrieves it and brings it back. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite the uh, the experience. Yeah. <laughs> so where do we want to begin with today's mystery? In the awesomely named Port Tobacco, Maryland. Today, Port Tobacco is the smallest incorporated town in the state of Maryland, with just 13 people living there, according to the 2010 census. Although, according to the 2020 census, the population has risen to a total of 15 people. (laughs) Woohoo! In the past, Port Tobacco was larger and more important. As its name suggests, it was a port from which tobacco would be exported, so it used to be a notable trade center. And we mentioned it previously here on Mysterious World since it was where the Russian prince and Catholic priest Father Demetrius Augustin Galitsyn was assigned, and we talked about him back in episode 115 on the Wizard Clip Ghost Story. And a very interesting incident is also said to have occurred in Port Tobacco around this time, which was just after the American Revolution, when we, you know, threw off the shackles of our British oppressors. And, of course, I'm joking. No offense to our friends across the pond. Today, we're best buds with our British oppressors. (laughs) And since Turnabout is fair play, I don't have any problem if folks from the UK want to speak about Americans as a bunch of upstart, uncouth, cantankerous colonists who were conducting a foolish, misguided experiment with democracy. In any event, uh, Port Tobacco is the scene of a fascinating story involving a retired Revolutionary War veteran named Charles Thomas Sims. According to the Southern Maryland news website, thebaynet.com, Soldier Charles Thomas Sims and a blue tick hound stepped into one of the many taverns said to inhabit the colonial town. 
We know the date was February 8th, and most legends place the story just after the American Revolution. Sim's tongue was loosened by the libations he consumed, and he began bragging about a quantity of gold he had on his person, along with a deed to his property. Henry Hanos of Port Tobacco and his friends were listening as Sims enumerated over and over how good his fortune had been. When the soldier started off from the tavern, he got as far as Rose Hill Manor in Charles County before he was confronted by Hanos and his friends, who demanded his money and the deed. Sims was killed in the confrontation, and his blue tick hound was also slain, valiantly trying to defend his master. Legend has it that both dog and man died atop a large stone at Rose Hill. Hanos took his stolen loot and buried it, along with the deed, under a holly tree that grew somewhere along Rose Hill Road. According to other accounts I've read, they buried the money and the deed because they didn't want to be connected to Sim's murder. There was bound to be an investigation, and they didn't want to get caught with the items while the investigation was underway. So they wanted to wait until enough time had passed that they could return and safely dig up the items without being suspected. But... When he went back later to retrieve the treasure, he was confronted by the ghost of the huge blue tick hound. Some versions of the story claim the dog was part mastiff, dogs bred for kings in ancient England. Either way, Blue Dog is a large dog of significant size and girth and could, apparently, literally frighten you to death. Shortly after this encounter, Hanos took sick and fell fatally ill. And so the legend of the Blue Dog ghost was born. The dog died trying to defend his master, and since then the ghost has protected his master's buried property. And I should clarify that the dog would not have been the color you might suppose. Blue tick hounds are a real breed, but they aren't literally blue. Instead, they're white with black spots, so from a distance they kind of look gray, which you could think of as blue. Also, this hound was rumored to be part mastiff, and mastiffs are among the largest dogs there are. They're often used as guard dogs, and they're even used as war dogs, meaning dogs used to help soldiers fight in wartime, as in Shakespeare's phrase from Julius Caesar, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. So mastiffs are big and intimidating, and encountering an angry ghost dog that's part mastiff could be quite frightening. TheBaynet.com continues. Reports of the Blue Dog's ghost began surfacing in the years that followed the soldier's death. During the American Civil War, General Joseph Hooker, who temporarily led the Grand Army of the Potomac until a disastrous rout at Chancellorsville, got him the hook, if you will, from President Abraham Lincoln, camped some 12,000 Union troops on the western shore of Charles County. From October 1861 through March 1862, Hooker maintained his headquarters at Chickamuxin Methodist Church. Some of Hooker's men had heard the Blue Dog legend and decided they would find and dig up the buried treasure. When they went to abscond with the money, they allegedly found themselves confronted by the luminous specter of a huge blue tick hound who aggressively challenged them to such an extent that they gave up the ghost. And Hooker's men weren't the only ones who saw the ghost. Olivia Floyd the Confederate spy who lived at Rose Hill Manor during the Civil War, confessed to the Port Tobacco Times in 1897 that she had encountered the ghost of the Blue Dog. And others have encountered the ghost as well. The last known recorded incident of someone encountering the ghostly beast occurred in 1971, when the howl of Blue Dog was heard. Several television crews who have sought evidence of the Blue Dog legend have filmed at Rose Hill the past two years on February 8th, when the howl of the faithful hound has been said to be most prominent. So that's the legend of the Blue Ghost Dog of Port Tobacco, Maryland. And what do you make of the legend, Jimmy? Well, I think it's a fun story, but I don't put a lot of credence in it. Uh, it hasn't, to my knowledge, been the subject of a competent paranormal investigation, and it's based on oral history, and the details of the story vary significantly from one account to another. I've even seen accounts that say the time frame of the story is off and that the ghost was around more than a century before the Revolutionary War. So I don't put a lot of stock in it. But it does get us into our mystery today, which is whether animals, like humans, survive death. Because if a dog's ghost shows up after the dog is dead, it would suggest that they do. Is this story of the Maryland blue ghost dog unique? Are there others like it? 
There are lots of stories about ghosts of animals showing up after they're dead, and folklorists have been collecting them. In fact, we'll have links to a couple of books on them, uh, both the book Ghost Dogs of the South and also Ghost Cats of the South. So the story we started with is far from alone. There are lots of reports of animals coming back from and thus having at, coming back from death and thus having an afterlife. And what do you make of stories like this? Are they at all possible? At one time, I would have given a definite no to that question. 30 years ago, when I first started working as an apologist, I hadn't done much reading or thinking about this subject. I knew that the standard theological opinion was that animals don't survive death, and I simply repeated the standard opinion. Then, after Catholic Answers Live started, I began getting questions from children or their parents who were asking about whether their pets would be in heaven. And I started to give a more pastorally sensitive answer, which was to tell children that if they need their pets to be happy, they'll have them. Which is true. In heaven, God will give us everything we need to be happy. And so if you really need your earthly pets to be happy in heaven, then they'll be there. It's the standard theological opinion that you won't need them, so this is a true but incomplete answer, but incomplete answers can be pastorally advisable. As Jesus himself told the disciples in John 16, 12, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. So if our Lord himself recognized that it was pastorally better not to unload everything all at once on his own disciples, the same could certainly be true for a grieving child. But have you started to reconsider the standard opinion that animals don't survive death? I have. And in part, this began as a result of uh, my writing uh, a book called Teaching with Authority. The subject of the book is the church's magisterium or its teaching authority. And writing the book focused my attention on the difference between theological opinion and church teaching. Properly speaking, theology is a realm of opinion, where authors are free to propose different ideas about how we should understand God based on the revelation he's given us. That's not the same thing as church doctrine, which is where the church takes a particular view and says, this isn't a matter of opinion. This is something that's true and that we need to believe. Catholics are free to accept or reject theological opinions based on what they think of the arguments for and against them. But since the Church is guided by the Holy Spirit, we need to accept it when the Church says something is definitely true and makes it a matter of doctrine. So I began thinking carefully about what matters are theological opinion and what matters are doctrine. And I realized that the question of whether animals survive death was just a matter of opinion not doctrine. You won't find magisterial documents mandating the view that animals don't survive death. And that means the claim that they don't is only as strong as the arguments for or against it. If you want to settle the question, you have to actually look at and evaluate the argument. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Excellent. So before we get into our theories and faith and reason perspectives, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Jonathan K., Mark R., Ronald B., Corey L., and Armand P. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about animals existing in the afterlife? Well, there are several kinds of issues we need to look at. One is the question of whether there will be any animals at all in the next world. And there are some possibilities here. First, it's possible that animals exist only in this life. And on this view, there would be no animals at all in the next world, either in the intermediate state between death and resurrection or on the new earth, where we'll live after the resurrection. 
Second, it's possible that there could be animals in the intermediate state between death and resurrection. And third, it's possible that there could be animals on the new earth after the resurrection of the dead. And so what else do we need to consider? Well, if there are no animals after this life, that settles the matter. But if there are animals in the next world, we need to consider the relationship they have with the animals we have around us now. And here again, there are several possibilities. First, it could be that they have no specific relationship with the individual animals we, we've we known. They're just of the same species. I mean, there might be dogs, but they might be dogs in general, not specific dogs that we've known in our life. You know, they could, for example, be the descendants of the dogs we have around us now, or they might be new dogs that God has created. But none of them would be my own pet dog, Zachron. He would have simply ceased to exist when he was put to sleep. And God created other dogs or let them procreate to be in the new world. So this would be an animals in general will exist theory. Second, there might be replicas of the animals we know in this life. For example, my pet dog, Zachron, may have ceased to exist when he was put to sleep, but God might recreate a new dog that in every way resembles him. And in this case, he would be a Zachron clone. And so this would be an animal clone theory. Then third, the animals after this life might be the very same ones we knew in this life, not members of the same species, not clones, but the exact same individual. So my pet dog, Zachron, would literally be there in the next world after he somehow survived being put to sleep. And this would be the animal survival theory. So to help listeners, how would you summarize the options we'll be considering? We have two major issues to look at. First, do animals exist after this life? Are there no animals at all? Do they exist in the intermediate state? And do they exist after the resurrection? And second, if they are present, what's their relationship with the animals in this life? Are they just members of the same species? Are they copies or clones of specific animals? Or are they the same individual animals who have survived death? Okay, so let's move on to our next section, which is what can we say about animals in the afterlife from the faith perspective? Well, let's start with the question of whether there will be any animals. Could there be animals on the new earth after the resurrection of the dead? Some Christian thinkers have proposed that apart from humans, there won't be any life at all on the new earth, that it instead will be kind of like a beautiful rock garden with all kinds of cool geology, but no biology. Against this argument, it could be pointed out that there are scripture passages that could suggest the presence of both plants and animals. For example, in Revelation 22.2, it states that on the new earth, the city New Jerusalem will have the tree of life from all the way back in the garden. Also, in Revelation 19.11, uh, it depicts a particular coming of Christ from heaven in which he's riding a white horse. And the passages in Isaiah 65 and 66, which contain the original new heavens and new earth prophecies, both contain references to plants and animals. Isaiah 65, 21 talks about people planting vineyards. And Isaiah 65, 25 famously says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And Isaiah 66, 24 also refers to there being worms. So do these passages settle the question of whether there'll be plants and animals on the new earth? I don't think so. Uh, for one thing, all of these passages are highly symbolic, and the plants and animals may well be symbolic. For example, in Revelation 22, it says that the leaves of the tree of life will be used for the healing of the nations. But that would suggest that sickness and disease are realities that still need to be treated. Also, Genesis 2 and 3, where the tree of life comes from, is itself a symbolic passage, and the tree is likely just a symbol of immortality. So it's most likely that the tree of life in Revelation 22 is just a symbol that people will be immortal and healthy. Uh, 
When it comes to Revelation 19, it's likely that the white horse Jesus is depicted as riding is also a symbol, that he won't literally be riding in on a flying horse out of the sky, um, and that the horse is a symbol of victory, since victors in the ancient world often rode white horses. When we come to Isaiah 65 and 66, we again have what are plausibly taken as symbols. The wolf and the lamb lying down together, a natural predator and its natural prey, may simply be a form of hyperbole, a symbol of universal peace, of how even those who have previously been enemies will be reconciled. And the same goes for lions eating straw like oxen, um, another animal-based hyperbole illustrating the absence of violence in a coming time of peace. So there are reasons to think that these don't have their primary fulfillment in the literal future new heavens and earth. Instead, it's that fulfillment, the one that's in our future, is likely a later, greater fulfillment of the original prophecy. And why do you say that? Because Isaiah 65 and 66 also contain references to humans living a long time, but eventually dying. And we know that we won't be dying in the resurrection of the dead. Also, these chapters contain references to human beings reproducing and having children. But according to the Gospels, Jesus makes it clear that that won't be happening since we'll be immortal. So I don't think that the biblical data tells us one way or the other whether there will be plants and animals in the final state of affairs. There are no passages that unambiguously indicate that there will be, but there are also no passages that unambiguously indicate that there won't be either. Let's suppose there are animals on the new earth. What would their relationship be to the ones we currently have around us? It's possible, as we mentioned, that they could simply be members of the same species, the descendants, for example, of the animals that are living today. All God would have to do to accomplish that is preserve them through the coming renovation of the earth, and then they'd be there on the new one. And that's certainly within his power, since he's going to preserve us through it. And what about animals that we have a personal connection with, like the pets we've had, could they be there? God could certainly recreate identical copies of the pets we've had in this life, like if we needed them to be happy or something. Uh, it would be trivial for him to create an identical copy of my dog, Zachron, a new dog who looked and acted exactly like my childhood pet. But it would be a new dog, not the same one, unless there were a core element that survived the death of the original dog and was now found in the new one. That brings us to the question of whether animals have souls. You often hear that animals don't have souls, but is this the church's understanding? It's not, and in fact, it's not even the common theological opinion. Uh, for centuries, the common opinion has been that animals do have souls. In fact, the common opinion is that all living beings have souls. That includes humans, animals, plants, fungi, and lesser-known kingdoms of life, such as bacteria, protozoa, archaea, and chromista, as well as any other kingdoms of life on Earth that are eventually classified and any life anywhere else in the universe. Bottom line, if you're alive, the common opinion is that you've got a soul. But are all these souls regarded as being the same? Not according to the standard opinion. Since the time of Aristotle, souls have been distinguished by the different powers they display. And St. Thomas Aquinas, whose philosophy on this point was a modified version of Aristotle's, uh, divided souls into three classes. Plants have what he called vegetative souls. Animals have what he called sensitive souls. And humans have what he called rational souls. Basically, the vegetative souls of plants allow them to consume nutrients, grow, and reproduce. The sensitive souls of animals allow them to sense the world around them, which is why they're called sensitive, and also to move around in the world. And the rational souls that humans have allow us to think in abstract ways, to have an intellectual understanding of the world. But still, for Aquinas, all living beings have souls of one kind or another. So what did Aquinas have to say about souls surviving death? He distinguished souls into two categories, non-rational souls and rational ones. And for him, the key question about pertaining to surviving death involved whether or not a soul constituted a substance. Today, we think of substances as a kind of material or stuff like 
air, water, and earth are substances. Or, you know, there are others like gold or glass or plastic. Those are also substances today. But that's not what Aquinas and other philosophers of the period meant by the term. Instead, they understood a substance to be not a kind of material, but an individual thing. Anything that was a thing, something that was a distinct entity that could exist by itself, was a substance. So I, Jimmy Aiken, would be a substance, and you, Domenico Bettinelli, would be a substance, and anything that can exist on its own would be a substance. And that led to the question of whether a soul was a substance, something that could exist on its own. Aquinas held that every rational soul was a substance, but that non-rational souls, so the vegetative and sensitive souls that plants and animals have, would not be substances on his view. Why would that be relevant to the question of whether a soul survives death? Because it involves the soul's relationship to the body. You and I have rational souls, which Aquinas held are substances, so when our bodies die, our souls can continue on and because they're things in and of themselves. So they can just keep going without the body and survive death. But souls that aren't substances, things that can exist on their own, like plant and animal souls, can't continue. Their souls are based on their bodies in such a way that when the body stops working and falls apart, so does the soul. So animals and anim plant and animal souls aren't continuing things that can survive the death of the body. And Aquinas concludes that only rational human souls survive death. Plant and animal souls simply cease to exist when their bodies stop living and start falling apart. How do you evaluate that claim? Like I said, it's not a matter of church teaching. It's a matter of theological opinion. And so we need to consider what the evidence has to say about it. And since this is a matter of philosophy, we'll need to look at a good bit of that evidence when we get to the reason perspective. Though we can't examine some of the evidence from the faith perspective since we have a statement of divine revelation to look at. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which is the famous to everything turn 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 there is a season chapter which pete seeger and then the birds used in the famous 1965 hit song and we'll have a link to where you can listen to the song if you don't know it because it's awesome but the passage says the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same as one dies so dies the other they all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth? Now, the first part of this involves what happens before death. Both men and beasts have the same breath, they both breathe air, and they both go to the same place. They die after which their bodies both turn to dust. So in these respects, men have no advantage over animals. But what about the breath they both have? The Hebrew word, word here is ruach, which can also be translated spirit. According to this passage, is there a difference between what happens to a man's spirit and an animal's? Here the author indicates that he doesn't know, which isn't surprising given the amount God had yet to reveal. Uh, the author says, who knows if the breath or spirit of man goes up and the breath or spirit of a beast goes down into the earth. That's likely a reference to the afterlife, but it isn't certain. If he just means breath and not spirit, then he's asking what happens to the breath of man and animal, uh, and that doesn't imply survival after death. On the other hand, given the question he's asking, it's likely that he is talking about the afterlife, and specifically, he sounds like he's responding to an opinion that some people in his own day had. In other words, the opinion that men's spirits went up to God while animal spirits went down into the earth. Of itself, that wouldn't mean that animals don't have an afterlife, just that they would experience it in a different place than men do. Or it could mean that animals' souls cease to exist. However, the overarching point that the author is making is he doesn't know what the truth of the matter is. And so as a result, we can't really conclude anything from this verse. Maybe animals survive death, but maybe they don't. The author doesn't know. And so the passage doesn't tell us. 
What do you make of the fact that Christian tradition has largely been skeptical on this point? There actually have been Christians, and a lot of them, who believe in the possibility of animal afterlife. It's primarily among certain influential theological circles where the idea has been poo-pooed. Um, but that makes it a matter of theological opinion, for which we'll need to examine the strength of the arguments for and against it. Does the fact that we don't have clear biblical passages saying that animals have an afterlife suggest that they don't? Well, that would be an argument from silence, and arguments from silence normally don't work. In particular, the, in his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis comments on this particular argument from silence. I have been warned not even to raise the question of animal immortality, lest I find myself in company with all the old maids. I have no objection to the company. I do not think either virginity or old age contemptible, and some of the shrewdest minds I have met inhabited the bodies of old maids. Nor am I greatly moved by jocular inquiries such as, where will you put all the mosquitoes? A question to be answered on its own level by pointing out that, if the worst came to the worst, a heaven for mosquitoes and a hell for men could very conveniently be combined. The complete silence of scripture and Christian tradition on animal immortality is a more serious objection. But it would be fatal only if Christian revelation showed any signs of being intended as a systematic account of nature answering all questions. But it is nothing of the sort. The curtain has been rent at one point, and at one point only, to reveal our immediate practical necessities and not to satisfy our intellectual curiosity. If animals were in fact immortal, it is unlikely, from what we discern of God's method in the revelation, that he would have revealed this truth. Even our own immortality is a doctrine that comes late in the history of Judaism. The argument from silence is therefore very weak. And I agree. The argument from silence here, as in most cases, is not decisive. Let's return to the subject of the soul. Aquinas said that the reason human souls survive death is that they are substances, while animal souls are not substances, so they don't survive. What do you make of this argument? At this point, we're crossing from the realm of faith, which depends on divine revelation, into the realm of philosophy, which belongs to the reason perspective. So let's just note that we're making that transition here from one perspective to another. When it comes to the claim that, the, that substantive souls survive death, well, that makes sense to me. If something is an independent substance that doesn't require the body to exist, then it's logical it would survive the death of the body. Uh, as an analytic philosopher, I can think of ways to challenge that, but it has enough plausibility that I'm willing to go with it for our purposes. When it comes to the claim that humans have souls that are substances, that also makes sense to me. Uh, many Christian philosophers have sought to argue that we can show by reason alone that our souls survive death. I'm skeptical of those arguments, but I haven't examined them closely enough to have a settled opinion. But as an item of faith, our souls do survive death when our body falls apart, so I'm willing to go with the claim that our souls survive death because they're substances. What about when it comes to the claim that animals don't have souls that are substances? This is much less clear to me, and here's where we need to look closer at the philosophical arguments on the matter. Specifically, we'll be looking at St. Thomas Aquinas's argument. It depends on a distinction between sense or sensation and intellect. It's obvious to everyone that animals have sensations. If you step on a dog's tail, he'll experience pain, he'll yelp, and he may try to bite you. So animals definitely have sense. It's also obvious that animals are not as smart as humans, so it was easy for some to say, well, animals just lack intellect. Aquinas then drew upon this idea that animals have sense but not intellect when it comes to how their souls work. In the Summa Theologiae, he wrote, The ancient pre-Socratic philosophers made no distinction between sense and intellect and referred both to a corporeal principle. Plato, however, drew a distinction between intellect and sense, yet he referred both to an incorporeal principle, maintaining that sensing, just as understanding, belongs to the soul as such. From this it follows that even the souls of brute animals are subsistent. So that's Plato's view. Even though there is a difference between sense and intellect, Plato thought that both of them were produced by something incorporeal, something that isn't bodily. And on that view, because animals have sense, 
they would have something about them that isn't bodily, something that could survive the death of the body. And it wouldn't matter if they didn't possess intellect because the fact they had sense would show that they possess an immaterial part. In that case, the animal souls would be subsistent and would be able to survive death. And indeed, Plato believed that this happened. In fact, he believed in reincarnation. So he thought that human and humans and animals did have immortal souls. And after you died, you could come back as a higher or lower form, depending on how you'd lived. But Aquinas isn't a Platonist. He's an Aristotelian. And so he reasons as follows. Aristotle held that of the operations of the soul, understanding alone is performed without a corporeal organ. So here Aquinas adopts a key premise from Aristotle. According to Aristotle, the understanding or intellect is the only thing that isn't performed with a bodily organ. It's the only thing that requires an immaterial part. On the other hand, sensation and the consequent operations of the sensitive soul are evidently accompanied with change in the body. Thus, in the act of vision, the pupil of the eye is affected by a reflection of color, and so with the other senses. Hence, it is clear that the sensitive soul has no per se operation of its own, and that every operation of the sensitive soul belongs to the composite. Wherefore, we conclude that, as the souls of brute animals have no per se operations, they are not subsistent, for the operation of anything follows the mode of its being. The reasoning is thus that, since animals have only sense and not intellect, everything their soul does is based on their bodies, like when color hits the eye. So you can see how that sense of vision is affected by physical things. You know, your pupil expands and contracts. And so, since he thought, only intellect doesn't depend on the body and they don't have intellect, then when their bodies fall apart at death, so do their souls. And what do you think of this argument? It depends crucially on two premises. Uh, first, there's a premise we mentioned earlier that animals have sense but not intellect. And second, there's the premise Aquinas simply takes over from Aristotle, that only the intellect requires an immaterial part. I think both of those assumptions are open to challenge, and I think the first, that animals don't have intellect, is quite problematic, so we'll focus on that one. Why do you think that the idea animals don't have intellect is problematic? One reason is that we lack a we lack clear definitions in this area. I mean, what precisely does it mean to have intellect or understanding? It's clear that animals aren't as smart as us, but intelligence is a spectrum, even among humans. Some humans are smarter than others. So maybe animals share in the same intelligence spectrum as us. They just aren't as far along that spectrum as most humans are. It's really hard to find a particular intellectual ability that all humans have and that all animals don't. Uh, severely retarded humans, for example, and humans that are in a persistent vegetative state don't display the reasoning ability presented in highly intelligent canines, for example. You could argue that this is because those humans have organic defects in their brains that don't allow the intelligence resident in their souls to manifest, even though they really do have rational souls. True. So some people have tried to take intellectual smarts out of the picture and focus on other traits like consciousness or a sense of self. But once again, we don't have clear definitions of what those terms mean. Uh, the fact it, that we can't give a rigorous definition for consciousness is one of the hardest problems in cognitive science today. And we certainly can't give a rigorous definition of what it means to have a sense of self. Furthermore, why should we pick on those two traits to focus on? Uh, we're, we, we're running the risk of just picking traits arbitrarily in a self-serving way to prop up the idea that we have something animals don't, like an immortal soul. It's also not obvious that animals don't have these things. Can you give the listeners some examples that would suggest animals do have things like consciousness or a sense of self? 
Well, in the 1600s, the French philosopher René Descartes proposed that animals don't have consciousness. He thought your pet dog is basically a mindless robot, a purely mechanical system with no consciousness of anything, just a set of mechanical behaviors. So your dog isn't really happy when you feed or pet him, and he doesn't feel love or affection for you. He has nothing at all going on inside his head. It's just the programmed actions of a mindless robot. But that's not how dogs act. They act like they are aware of things, that they do have consciousness. They also act like they have a sense of self. Even, even wild dogs act as if they have a sense of self. Try taking away the food that they're eating, and you'll find out very quickly that they have a sense that that's my food and that you're taking something that is theirs, indicating a sense of self. And YouTube is full of funny dog videos about people or other animals stealing a, do a dog's favorite toy or sleeping in his bed, the dog's bed, and watching the dog's reaction, which is based on the idea that the dog has a sense that the toy or the bed is his, again, indicating a sense of self. A problem with all these efforts is that we don't have access to what's going on in a dog's head. So all of these claims that dogs and other animals don't have things like this is speculation. And it runs the risk of being self-justifying speculation because all we can rely on is the observable behavior of animals. And their behavior suggests that they have the same fundamental mental properties that we do. They behave as if they have them in different degrees, but not as if they lack basic mental features like consciousness or a sense of self. And frankly, I think there's been an enormous amount of time wasted in this direction. When you read The Problem of Pain, uh, when you read its discussion of uh, animals, C.S. Lewis spends an inordinate amount of time considering whether animals have consciousness or a sense of self and the implications of that would or wouldn't be this or that. But frankly, I want to say we don't have any evidence for this. The evidence points the other way. Stop trying to deny the perfectly obvious in an attempt to accommodate a predetermined theory and just follow the evidence. They do have consciousness and a sense of self. And unfortunately, since C.S. Lewis's time, or really over history, the problem has gotten worse with time. Why do you say that this problem has gotten worse? Because as early as the Middle Ages, the idea that animals have sense but not intellect was already breaking down. In her paper, Do Animals Go to Heaven?, historian Joyce Salisbury writes, Medieval analysts sometimes had to work hard to preserve the notion that animals lacked reason. When philosophers observed complex behavior in animals, they searched for explanations that required only instinct, not rational thought. For example, a much-discussed instance was why a sheep ran from a wolf. There was nothing obviously hazardous in the appearance of the wolf, that is, in its color, furriness, four-leggedness, etc., yet a sheep ran in its presence. Medieval thinkers solved this dilemma by positing a sixth sense called estimativa that could perceive intentionality. Philosophers kept adding internal senses to avoid granting animals the possibility of rational thought, and by the 12th century, Avicenna argued for an additional five senses to explain the vagaries of observed instinctive behavior in animals. These efforts were intended to keep animals from sharing what philosophers perceived as the defining human quality of logical reasoning, and this quality was what defined soul, in which was the entry ticket to heaven. Human exceptionalism and heaven itself rested on the capacity for logical reasoning. So even in the Middle Ages, authors were having trouble defending the idea that animals have sense but not reason. It was perfectly obvious that sheep ran from wolves as if they were threats, and this wasn't due to any sensory quality that the wolves had, like how furry or four-legged they were or what color they were. It looked like the sheep understood the wolf as a threat and acted accordingly. So to avoid the implication that they really did understand the concepts, that's a wolf and wolves are a threat, 
the authors proposed that the sheep had an additional sense beyond the conventional five that was called estimativa. And estimativa allowed them to act as if they understood the concepts of wolves and the threat they posed, even though they didn't really understand these concepts. And eventually, authors proposed up to five additional animal senses as a way of explaining away the apparently intelligent behavior of animals. What has recent research shown in this area? It hasn't helped. The 20th and 21st centuries have seen an explosion of scientific research into animal intelligence. And the overwhelming trend of this research has been to show that higher animals have the same basic cognitive features as humans. They have them in different degrees, but there are no clear examples where humans have a basic mental feature that all animals simply and totally lack. We'll have a link to an excellent talk by the anthropologist Robert Sapolsky, where he shows the ways in which humans are unique compared to other animals. What's unique about us is not the fundamental mental traits we have. Instead, it's what we do with those mental traits, the extraordinary and complex ways we employ them. But complexity is a matter of degree, not of kind. Let's have an example of that. Can you name a mental feature that it was once thought only humans have, but that recent findings have cast doubt on? It used to be thought that only humans have what is called theory of mind. That is, we understand that other minds exist, and so other people have different knowledge, beliefs, and so forth than we personally do. In humans, this ability begins to manifest between two and five years of age. Sometime in that range, kids start to realize, hey, my parents know something that I don't, and hey, I may know something my parents don't. Well, if you're talking about a good test for the positive presence of consciousness or intellect or understanding or any other quality you want to name like this, theory of mind is a good test. If you can understand that someone else has their own intellect that is conscious of different things and understands different things than you do, then that's a very good indicator you have qualities like consciousness, intellect, and understanding. You're thinking pretty abstractly if you know that other person has a or other creature has a mind that knows different things than I know. But it turns out, Humans aren't the only creatures with theory of mind, at least to some degree. To give a simple example, rhesus monkeys like to eat grapes, and they're willing to steal grapes from humans in order to get them. But lab experiments have shown that rhesus monkeys are more likely to try to steal the grapes if they know that the human in the vicinity can't see the grapes compared to if they know the human in the vicinity can see the grapes they're about to steal. This indicates that rhesus monkeys are thinking about the human and what the human is and isn't aware of. You know, will I get caught if I go for those grapes that are in his field of vision or not? Um, and this means that to some degree, they're displaying theory of mind. And it isn't just rhesus monkeys. There's a lot of, there's evidence that a lot of other animals have some degree of theory of mind, including chimpanzees, parrots, ravens, goats, pigs, and dogs. But humans have theory of mind to a different degree than other creatures. Yes, we have what's been called secondary theory of mind, although it might better be called iterative theory of mind. If regular theory of mind lets me keep track of what Alice believes. Secondary theory of mind allows me to keep track of what Alice believes about what Bob believes. And there's no reason for the process to stop there. 
it may require more work, but I can also keep track of what Alice believes, about what Bob believes, about what Charles believes, about what Danielle believes, and so on. Uh, this is one of the things that allows humans to enjoy situation comedies and dramas where different characters are aware of different pieces of information. If we didn't have this secondary theory of mind, we couldn't keep track of, oh, the detective knows this and the murderer doesn't realize it. So, yeah, humans have a high degree of theory of mind, but other creatures have it in other degrees. And if you have any degree of theory of mind, if you're aware that others have intellects different than yours, well, that's a good sign you've got an intellect. And it then seems to me entirely arbitrary to insist that an intellect must have some particular degree of smarts or whatever, in order to qualify as being a rational soul. Reason isn't binary. It's not a you have it or you don't quality. It comes in degrees. And since other creatures share in the same fundamental qualities that we have, only different in degree, it seems to me that they also have reason, just in a different degree. I, I mean, you can define the word reason so that they don't. You could say you've got to have an IQ above this level for you to have reason, but that's an arbitrary thing. That's really, we've got a spectrum here. And so I don't see evidence from the reason perspective that we must say that animal souls are different in ours in kind, but in degree. What would you need to see for a counter argument on this point to be compelling? I'd need to see two things. First, I'd need to see a concrete proposal for a specific mental quality that humans have and other animals on Earth don't. This quality could be a matter of degree if someone wants to propose one, like you need an IQ of this or above, or it could be a, involve a matter of kind, a mental ability that we possess that other creatures have in no degree whatsoever. And second, I would need to see a compelling philosophical argument for why this quality should be regarded as indicating that souls are different in kind and not just in degree. Both of these things would be, nece would be necessary for me, both a specific mental quality that really does distinguish us from animals and also a compelling philosophical argument for why that quality would result in our souls being substances and their souls not being. I mean, I don't want to hear just assertions. I need an argument. I need evidence. And thus far, I haven't found anyone today attempting to do those things. Uh, normally, the authors that I see don't address the subject at all, or they repeat arguments from the Middle Ages and don't address modern studies on animal cognition. Uh, the people I'm aware of just tend to repeat old conclusions and arguments, and they're not really grappling with the new data. So I don't find the philosophical argument that animals' souls must be different than ours in kind rather than degree to be convincing. Of course, that's not the same as having positive evidence that they are the same or that they do survive death. Is there positive evidence we should look at? In fact, there is a lot more evidence than you might suspect. There's so much that I could end today's show right here and wait till next week to present the positive evidence because there's enough for a full hour. But I'm not going to do that. Um, instead, uh, we're going to look briefly at two lower order kinds of evidence and at one higher order kind of evidence. What are the lower or order kinds of evidence? Well, the first is the intuitions that many pet owners have. A lot of people feel a really deep connection with their pets, and they feel like there's a real personality there. And many of them grieve deeply when the pet dies, and many of them have the instinct that the pet's mind and personality is so real that if our minds survive and personalities survive death, then theirs must too. What do you think about the value of this argument as evidence? I, I think it has some weight, not a lot, but some. Uh, quite apart from divine revelation, there is a universal human intuition that there is an afterlife for us. Belief in the afterlife is a human universal that's found in every culture, everywhere in the world, in all periods of history. 
I think that the human intuition that there is an afterlife is very serious evidence that there is one. So I can't simply dismiss the intuition that many pet owners have that if humans are the kinds of beings that have an afterlife, then pets are too. What are the limitations of this argument? The intuition of animal afterlife isn't as strong in world history as belief in human afterlife. It's still remarkably strong, and there are lots of cultures where people intuit that animals have afterlives. And even a lot of Christians share this intuition, despite the discouragement it gets in some circles. But it's still not as strong an intuition, and the intuition may be based on a misreading of animals. Humans have a known tendency to think of other creatures anthropomorphically, as if they were more similar to humans than they are. And especially in today's cushy world, people may develop inappropriate levels of attachment to their pets. You even see people referring to their pets unironically as their children, which is way anthropomorphic. Do you think it's wrong for people to refer to pets as children? Well, I'm quite sensitive to the flexibility of language and how people can mean different things by the same terms. So there are very few modes of language I would say must never be used, but it really comes down to what a person means when they're using language a certain way. I mean, both the word pet and the word child are terms of affection. And so I can see a certain interconvertibility between them. I mean, for example, in the history of English, adults have referred to people that they love with nicknames like my baby, my sweetie, my pet. And sometimes they use animal names for people they love. In Latin, people would have nicknames for the people that they loved like my baby, my sweetie, my chicken. <laughs> and Pepe Le Pew has his trademark, my little love pigeon. <laughs> we even call such nicknames pet names. So they're drawing on a common stock of linguistic concepts. And if people can refer to humans they love as pets, I don't see anything intrinsically wrong with people referring to pets as humans. So I can easily imagine people doing pet talk and saying things like, who's a good boy? Who's a good girl? Oh, you're my little baby. And terms like boy, girl, and baby are explicitly child-based. So I don't think there's anything wrong in principle here. Are there cases when you feel something is wrong when people talk about pets as children? Yeah, a clear case would be when I see people who don't have real children start talking about their pets as their children and saying it not in a playful, but in a straightforward, unironic way. And I see this a lot in animal videos on YouTube, and I start to suspect that this is an unhealthy form of attachment, that these people may be using pets as a surrogate to satisfy a human parental urge that is meant to be satisfied by having actual children. Um, and so I, I don't think that's healthy to use pets as a surrogate for kids. If you have, if you're married and you can have kids, don't get a cat or a dog, have a kid. Um, that's what kids are for is to, is to be had. So um, in any event, uh, over attachment to animals is something that can be very real in our culture. And it could distort intuitions about whether animals are the kinds of beings that would have afterlifes. And then what's the second kind of lower order evidence that you mentioned? Animal ghost stories like the Maryland blue ghost dog. Uh, that one is not particularly well documented and I, I don't place weight on it. But there are lots of people who report encountering animals after the animals have died, especially their own pets. Now, if you're a skeptic who dismisses all ghost stories out of hand, well, then, of course, you're going to dismiss those, too. But... If you think it's possible that departed spirits can appear to some people, then you'll need to be at least initially open to the possibility that, in principle, animal spirits might sometimes appear to people as well. At least from the perspective of reason, you'd need to be open to the possibility. You might have theological beliefs that tell you this can't happen, in which case your faith commitments are telling you this isn't a possibility. But if you're looking at it from the reason perspective rather than the faith perspective, and reason allows you to entertain the possibility of human ghosts, then you'll want to look at whether there's also evidence for animal ghosts. 
How much evidence is there for animal afterlife in ghost reports? More than you might think. The problem is that evaluating ghost evidence is tricky because it occurs in the field rather than in controlled, like, laboratory settings. Also, a lot of the people who are researching it are goofballs. Uh, there are serious, competent paranormal field investigators who are very careful and look for naturalistic explanations before concluding something is paranormal. But the people that you see on typical TV ghost hunting shows and their real-life imitators are just thoroughly incompetent and their judgments are not to be trusted. It may well exist, I think it probably actually does, but thus far I have not encountered solidly researched parapsychological evaluations of animal ghost reports. So we won't be presenting uh, that in this episode, but if I encounter such literature in the future, we may talk about it in a future episode. Even if a competent investigation indicated that there is a spirit manifesting in a certain place, how would you know it was really an animal spirit rather than some other kind of spirit pretending to be one? Well, you likely couldn't prove it 100%, but then you can't ever prove it 100% that a spirit is who it appears to be. The biblical prophets couldn't always be sure when they were talking to God, as in the case of the boy prophet Samuel, who was talking to God at one point, even though he thought he was not talking to God. Um, or when angels appeared in human form and people thought they were talking to humans instead of angels. The Christian prophets in the New Testament similarly needed to test the spirits to see whether they are of God or not, and people who receive private revelations need to do the same thing, because spirits do sometimes appear to be things other than what they are, and so the apparent spirit of an animal could be a different kind of spirit. Are there ways to try to solve this problem? Well, uh, when you come home and you see your spouse how do you know it's really your spouse? I mean, how do you know it's not an evil twin or an actor that the CIA has surgically altered to look like your spouse? Or how do you know you're not dreaming or hallucinating that you're seeing your spouse? Most of the time, we can dismiss possibilities like that as extremely unlikely, especially when we're interacting with someone face to face. But through the mail or over the phone or on the Internet, it is much easier to pull off an impersonation of someone. And soon with deep fake video that will apply to video calls and virtual reality encounters as well. Whenever you encounter somebody in whatever forum, you form an initial impression of who they appear to be. You can then do tests to see if that appearance holds up or if there's evidence that they're an imposter. And the more data you have about the person you're encountering, the harder it will be for them to pull off an impersonation. So if the appearance does hold up that they are who they seem to be, then at some point you need to accept the identity as genuine. And these same principles apply whenever there is a question of identity, whether it's a discarnate spirit whether it's a person you're meeting face to face or whether it's someone you're in remote communication with, like through the mail or over the phone or online. You can test the appearance, but if it holds up, then the rational thing to do is accept the person's apparent identity. So if you have a spirit manifesting in some situation and it appears to be the spirit of an animal, you could do your best to test whether that's the case. But if the appearance holds up, Reason would tell you to go ahead and accept that it's an animal spirit. Your theological convictions might tell you it can't be, but then again, that's your theological convictions telling you, not what the reason perspective would tell you. So bottom line, don't be paranoid. Uh, test things, you know, trust but verify. Uh, but we should accept things at face value unless we have evidence to the contrary. Speaking of evidence, you said that there was one more type of evidence we were going to look at, a higher order of evidence than the two kinds you just mentioned. So what's that? Near-death experiences, or NDEs. We talked in general terms about near-death experiences way back in episode 27, but we didn't talk about NDEs and animals, so that's what we're going to do now. Why do you say that NDEs represent a higher order of evidence than the other two categories we mentioned? 
Because they don't just occur in the field. They often occur in controlled settings like hospitals where you can verify whether someone was clinically dead or not. And in recent years, there has been a lot of study done on NDEs. So it's possible to do statistical analyses of them. And the sur and surveys have been taken of the people who've had NDEs with standardized questions being asked about what the people experienced. And guess what? People report seeing animals in the afterlife in NDEs. They even report seeing animals they've known. What you make of this will be due in part to what you think of near-death experiences in general. If you think they have no evidential value regarding the existence of a human afterlife, then of course you won't think they provide evidence of an animal afterlife either. But if you do think NDEs provide evidence of a human afterlife, and if the humans coming back from that afterlife report seeing not only Jesus and their loved ones, but also their pets, that would count as evidence towards animals also having an afterlife. Couldn't you just dismiss the animals as hallucinations or symbols of joy and comfort or something else? You could, but there would be problems. I mean, if the animals that people are seeing are just hallucinations, why aren't the departed loved ones they see also hallucinations? In fact, why isn't the whole experience just a hallucination, in which case NDEs don't serve as evidence for an afterlife? Or if the animals are just symbols of comfort and joy, why aren't the departed loved ones also just symbols of comfort and joy? Bottom line, if you want to accept NDEs as evidence of an afterlife, then you'll need to give weight to the evidence they offer of animals being in that afterlife. And as with any evidence, you'll need to take it at face value until you have reason not to. So if you want to say uh, some aspect of what people report about the afterlife, like it has animals, is not what it seems, you'll need to offer reasons for that. Then let's look at some of what people have reported. Can you give us some examples of people who have reported seeing animals they knew during near-death experiences? I can, and for this we'll be drawing on Dr. Edward Anderson's book, Evidence for Animal Afterlife. Here is a typical account taken from his book. I saw my deceased dog from my childhood bounding towards me. I remember exclaiming her name at the top of my lungs as I saw her bounding towards me. It was overwhelmingly wonderful. I felt completely at peace and totally happy. I was so excited to see her again, and I did not question the experience at the time. It was as if she had never died, and she had always been waiting for me. This is essentially similar to how many people report meeting their loved ones on the other side who are there to greet them. But sometimes people who are clinically dead see other people who they don't know and don't have an emotional attachment to. And the same thing is true of seeing animals. It's not always their own pets. Dr. Anderson writes, Sometimes the person having an NDE has no emotional attachment to the person or animal being seen. If an NDE is just a comforting hallucination of reunion with loved ones, as skeptics insist, why would someone see a human being or an animal with whom they have no emotional connection? There is no sense of blissful reunion here. There is no reunion at all, since there was never any relationship in the first place. For example, a woman reported seeing a number of different types of animals in her NDE, cats and dogs mostly. They were just sort of hanging around. She didn't know any of them and didn't have any particular emotional reaction to them. She was told they were waiting for their human companions to arrive. Another person saw a deer, a squirrel, and a rabbit in her NDE. She didn't know or have a relationship with any of them. Cases like this are not uncommon. The person has no emotional relationship with the animals being seen. It doesn't make sense to explain these as comforting hallucinations based on the joyful feeling of reunion with deceased loved ones, because there's no joyful feeling of reunion, and these aren't deceased loved ones. The animals are typically reported in a factual way, without any particular emotion attached, just as neutral observations. A particularly weighty argument in favor of the reality of near-death experiences is that when people come back, they sometimes accurately report information they didn't have before they clinically died. Like, they'll come back and report things that were happening in other parts of the hospital while they were dead, not things that were happening in the room they were in. And if they can come back and know things they didn't know before, that's evidence that their experience after their heart stopped was real. 
And we talked about some examples of that back in episode 27. Well, it turns out that the same thing happens with animal encounters during NDEs. Dr. Anderson writes about the case of a woman who was in a coma for several days before she died. Five hours after being declared dead, she sat bolt upright, shouting. She had experienced an NDE. In her NDE, she saw her deceased mother greet her cat. Although the woman knew that her mother had passed on, she did not know her cat had. Her cat had been alive before she entered her coma. It had died suddenly during her coma. She was completely unconscious during her coma and did not have any way of knowing that her cat had died. So why would she see her cat in the hereafter if, for all she knew, her cat was still alive? I also found it interesting that she saw her deceased mother greeting her cat as if the cat had just arrived. And I think, I think both of those facts are really significant. The woman did not know that her cat had died. The cat died while she was in the coma. And then when she had her near-death experience, she sees her mom, who's one of her loved ones, greeting the cat as if the cat had just died, which it had. And she came back with that information, even though she didn't have it when she went into the coma. So that's, that's pretty significant to my mind. And here's a similar case. A man died and had an NDE. The man had been adopted at birth. In his NDE, he saw another man, a stranger to him, who was holding a cat, also unknown to him. Much later, plowing through old family photographs, he found a photo of a man holding a cat. You guessed it, it was the man and cat he saw in his NDE. After doing some additional investigation, he discovered that the man in the photo was a biological brother he never knew he had, and the cat belonged to the brother. Both were deceased. So cases where people come back from NDEs with accurate information they didn't have before about animals, as well as about people, are also a thing. You can propose alternative explanations for how they get this information, and some cases are easier to explain than others, but taken at face value, it looks like these people are getting accurate information they didn't have before about animals they encounter while they're clinically dead. How common is it for people to see animals in the afterlife? This is difficult to determine because the surveys typically don't ask about it. Uh, in filling them out, people may report seeing an animal, but did you see an animal while you were dead is not one of the typical questions that gets asked because the researchers are far more interested in the question of human afterlife. Animal afterlife really isn't on their radar, but People do report it. In his book, uh, Dr. Anderson indicates that he had found 62 cases in the literature, though he stated that this was almost certainly an underestimate. He pointed out, for example, that the Near Death Experience Research Foundation has collected more than 4,900 NDE accounts from all over the world online, but the website doesn't let you easily find ones mentioning animals. Well, my Google Foo is pretty good, so I went to work and I found that of the approximately 5,000 NDE accounts on the website, 594 referred to dogs, 194 referred to cats, 128 referred to horses, and 144 referred to pets. Some of those uh, NDE accounts may refer to more than one type of animal, but if we do a rough estimate by just adding up those total numbers, those four search terms, uh, then that's a total of 1,060 accounts of the 4,900 accounts on the website, or 22%. In other words, around a fifth of the NDEs on the site mentioned animals using just those four terms. And you could have thought of others like, you know, rabbit or animal or things like that. Now, not all of them may be referring to animals seen during the NDEs. It's possible that some are referring to animals people saw before or after they were clinically dead, though I wouldn't think there would be too many of those because the purpose is to record what happened during the NDE. Still, Let's be generous and knock 10% off the total to account for animals seen only before or after the NDE and for NDEs where people mention more than one kind of animal. There would still be 954 accounts mentioning animals, which would be 19% of the 4,900. So that's still basically a fifth 
of the NDE reports indicating animals were seen. And that's without asking a specific question about, did you see them? Did you see any? It's just people bringing it up on their own. And if a fifth of people coming back from clinical death are reporting seeing animals while they were dead, then that's a very notable aspect of the experience on par with some of the other common features people report experiencing. And so it would need to be taken as seriously as those other features. By the way, uh, after uh, my searching turned up all those results, I contacted Dr. Anderson and let him know. And he thanked me and said that he would include them in future discussions of the subject. And he also wrote a blog post on the findings, which we'll have a link to. So at this point, let's go back to the faith perspective and talk about a few matters. You mentioned that C.S. Lewis did not think the arguments from silence about animals not having an afterlife was particularly strong. So what did he end up concluding on the topic? He proposed that there very well may be an afterlife now he, for animals. Now, he didn't think that all animals have an afterlife. He thought that some animals might be so basic that they don't really have consciousness and so might not survive death, you know, like a bacterium or something or a bug. But others, he thought, have been so influenced by humans that they have acquired these things. In particular, he thought domesticated animals may experience an afterlife due to their connection with their masters. In The Problem of Pain, he wrote, Insofar as the tame animal has a real self or personality, it owes this almost entirely to its master. If a good sheepdog seems almost human, that is because a good shepherd has made it so. You must not think of a beast by itself and call that a personality and then inquire whether God will raise and bless that. You must take the whole context in which the beast acquires its selfhood, namely the good man and the good wife, ruling their children and their beasts in the good homestead. The whole context may re be regarded as a body in the Pauline or a closely sub-Pauline sense, and how much of that body may be raised along with the good man and the good wife who can predict. So much, presumably, as is necessary, not only for the glory of God and the beatitude of the human pair, but for that particular glory and that particular beatitude, which is internally colored by that particular terrestrial experience. And in this way, it seems to me possible that certain animals may have an immortality, not in themselves, but in the immortality of their masters. And the difficulty about personal identity in a creature barely personal disappears, when the creature is thus kept in its proper context. If you ask, concerning an animal thus raised as a member of the whole body of the homestead, where its personal identity resi resides, I answer, where its identity always did reside, even in the earthly life, in its relation to the body and, especially, to the master who is the head of that body. In other words, the man will know his dog, the dog will know its master, and in knowing him will be itself. To ask that it should in any other way know itself is probably to ask for what has no meaning. Animals aren't like that and don't want to be. Lewis also thought that it was possible wild animals may also have an afterlife, though he was less sure about this. Have other Christian thinkers in recent times addressed this issue? They have, and one is the Catholic philosopher Peter Kraft. In his book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Heaven, he considers the questions about he considers questions about heaven, and he writes Question Are there animals in heaven? The simplest answer is why not? How irrational is the prejudice that would allow plants, green fields and flowers, but not animals into heaven? Much more reasonable is C.S. Lewis's speculation that there will be between the angels, who are our elder brothers, and the beasts, who are our jesters, servants, and playfellows. Scripture seems to confirm this. Thy judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast thou savest, O Lord. Animals belong in the new earth as much as trees. C.S. Lewis supposes that animals are saved in their masters as part of their extended family. Only tamed animals would be saved in this way. It would seem more likely that wild animals are in heaven too, since wildness, otherness, not mindness, is a proper pleasure for us. The very fact that the seagull takes no notice of me when it utters its remote, lonely call is part of its glory. Would the same animals be in heaven as on earth? Is my dead cat in heaven? Again, why not? God can raise up the very grass, why not cats? Though the blessed have better things to do than play with pets, the better does not exclude the lesser. 
We were meant from the beginning to have stewardship over the animals. We have not fulfilled that divine plan yet on earth. Therefore, it seems likely that the right relationship with animals will be part of heaven, proper petship. And what better place to begin than with already petted pets? Personally, I tend to agree with Kreeft more than with Lewis. Both of them envision the possibility of animals being in heaven, but Lewis feels more confident of this in terms of domesticated animals. I think this is in part due to the era in which he was writing, when many people were far more likely to dismiss the idea of an animal afterlife just out of hand, based on what they'd been told without really considering the arguments. Lewis found it easier to imagine animals surviving death if they had a vital connection with mankind, which we know survives death, but this is based on an anthropocentric worldview, one that treats mankind as the exclusive center of God's creation, so that everything in the universe is created just for us. But I find it hard to think that way. Given the immense size of the physical universe, of which humanity is only an infinitesimal part, and given the imme immense span of time that the universe occupies again, of which humanity is only an infinitesimal part, I find it hard to imagine that all of this is just for us. I conclude that God's creation is primarily for God himself, not primarily for us. Man has a unique role in God's creation, at least as far as the planet Earth goes, and we have a right to use animals to fulfill legitimate human needs, but ultimately they're for God rather than for us, as the Catechism states. Animals are God's creatures. He surrounds them with his providential care. By their mere existence, they bless him and give him glory. Thus, men owe them kindness. So even though we can use animals to fulfill our needs, we owe them kindness because of their relationship to God. All of this, all of reality, is ultimately about him, not us. And so I don't find it necessary to link animals to mankind in order for them to have an afterlife. God cares for all of his creatures, and if the evidence indicates that he's given them souls that survive death, I don't find a need to restrict that to only domesticated animals. If animals have an afterlife, where do they go in it? Was that movie from back in 1989 right? Do all dogs go to heaven? This is a question on which we have to be careful because God doesn't tell us. Uh, we know that for humans, there are two destinies, heaven and hell. However, even with humans, theologians have speculated that there might be another sort of destiny for those who die without personal sin, but without receiving sanctifying grace. This is the theoretical state known as limbo, which has been speculated to be a state of natural happiness, one where people would have great natural joy, but just not the supernatural joy of being fully united with God. Recent theology has looked less favorably on this option, uh, in view of God's universal salvific will for all humans, it's been held that God makes heaven a real possibility for everybody. But the fact that this has even been speculated, that there's this kind of limbo, natural joy place, at least points to the possibility of situations other than full-on hell or full-on heaven. So God might allow animals to go to heaven or hell or somewhere else, theoretically. What do you think of the idea of animals going to hell? I think this would be unlikely. Uh, God doesn't want human beings to go to hell, and hell is really the state of human beings who have knowingly and deliberately rejected the ultimate source of goodness, which is God himself. So if you cut yourself off from goodness, of course, that's going to be frustrating. And that's the that's the primary uh, suffering in hell, is the frustration of cutting yourself off from goodness from joy. Um, human beings, though, like small children and those with severe mental handicaps, are not capable of making that kind of deliberate rejection of God, and so they won't go there. And while many animals show traces of moral thinking, they don't show the ability to make this kind of deliberate rejection of ultimate goodness. So I would think it would be very unlikely that dogs would be in hell because they simply, or animals would be in hell because they simply lack the ability to fun freely and fundamentally cut themselves off from the source of infinite goodness. 
Okay, then what about them going to heaven? Heaven is spiritual union with God, and so far as we can tell, no animals here on earth have the concept of God. Therefore, they also couldn't make a conscious choice to be with God. Uh, they can't choose him over other goods. And so, at least based on what they're capable of doing in this life, it would make sense if they also didn't have the kind of full spiritual union with God in the afterlife that we can. That would point us toward animals having a state like some have thought limbo to be, a state of natural joy or happiness without the full supernatural joy and happiness of being united with God. Is that what you think animal afterlife may involve? It's certainly possible and one that the arguments could suggest. However, any state of union with God is a grace, a gift that exceeds what our nature requires. And so God could give this gift to animals if he chose, just like he chose to give the gift to us. Furthermore, animals' limited intellect in this life would not be a barrier. We humans will get a definite cognitive upgrade in the next life. In uh, 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve, St. Paul states, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So now we only know God dimly, but later we'll know him much more fully. And the same could be true of animals. Maybe they have a dim sense of something greater than themselves. In fact, many animals do seem to have a sense of something greater than themselves, which is why animals like dogs, horses, elephants, ravens, and others often seem to seek help from humans when they have a problem they can't solve on their own. And Maybe, just like God will increase human awareness of him as the ultimate source of goodness in the afterlife, maybe God would do that for some animals, in which case they might also get boosted intellects by grace and be able to contemplate and have, have union with God. Scripture even speaks of God giving uh, Balaam's donkey a temporary intellect boost in Numbers 22, and if he did that, he could give a permanent intellect boost to any animal he chooses. After all, the gift of intellect that we have comes from God, and we're going to get more of it in the future. So whether God will do that for animals is speculation, but it's possible. What would be more natural, though, would be to assume that animals that act in keeping with the degree of moral reasoning that they have in this life will be rewarded accordingly, and that without a knowledge of God, they won't have the full spiritual union with him that we call heaven. Would that cause a problem for the reports of humans who can have union with God being in the afterlife alongside their pets? Not at all. Even in this life, humans are alongside their pets, and humans are aware of things their pets are not. If you're watching TV alongside your dog, you're undoubtedly perceiving and getting more out of the experience than your dog is. So in the afterlife, we could it could easily be the case that humans and animals are alongside each other with humans having a full-on experience of supernatural union with God, while the animals beside them are having a joyful experience, but not one as rich as the human is having. At least that's a possibility. What would you make of the argument that this is unfair? Humans have the possibility of going to hell while animals wouldn't. Doesn't that seem unfair to humans? I'd say this is essentially the same as the situation as with infants or people with severe mental handicaps. As Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility, and as Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much will be required. If we've been given the ability to make a free, responsible choice for or against God, then we'll be held responsible for the choice we make. But if others, like infants, the severely retarded, or animals, haven't been given that ability, then they'll only be held responsible for the choices they were capable of making. And so ultimately, fairness is maintained. Are there advantages that you see to adopting the view that animals have an afterlife? One advantage would be the problem of evil. For a long time, it's been easier to see how it could be okay for God to allow innocent human beings to suffer evil in this life because he can make it up to them in the next. 
But if animals don't have an afterlife, God couldn't make it up to them in that way. And as a result, the fact that innocent animals appear to suffer in this life without being compensated has long been thought to be a problem. But if animals do have an afterlife, that problem is solved. God can make up things that innocent animals suffered in this life. He can more than make it up to them. So for animals, like for us, Paul's statement in Romans 8.18 could be true that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I just recommend that philosophers and theologians working on the problem of evil consider the impact that animal afterlife would have. In fact, C.S. Lewis raised, uh, raised the question in his discussion of this in The Problem of Pain. Would animals having an afterlife create a problem? I mean, if every animal, no matter how big or small, even every bacterium had an afterlife, wouldn't there be problems fitting them on Earth? If things work the way they do now, then yes, it would cause a problem with the space available. But then the same thing would be true of the human beings that are resurrected. According to current estimates, over the course of human history, approximately 100 billion humans have lived. And when all of them are resurrected, they're going to need space to live, whether they're among the saved or the lost. Also, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, St. Paul says that after the second coming, that all of the saved will be together with the Lord Jesus always. But Revelation, the book of Revelation, describes the number of the saved as a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And since Revelation uses numbers like 10,000 times 10,000 or 100 million, that would suggest that the number of the saved is even more vast than that, very likely in the billions. So how could billions of members of the body of Christ be with Jesus always? It wouldn't be physically possible for billions of humans to be crowded around one person like that if space works the same way on the new earth that it does here. So I think that it's much more likely that space and maybe time will work very differently in the eternal order than they do now, and we won't be subject to the same spatial limitations we are in this life. But if that's the case for us, for human beings, then it could be true for animals. If God arranges for all the vast multitude of humans that have ever lived to be able to be resurrected and live on the new earth, then he could do the same for all the animals that have ever lived too. After all, he's the infinitely powerful creator who produced the entire physical universe in the first place. He can certainly come up with the room needed for the members of the species, human and otherwise, that have inhabited a tiny little planet like Earth. And if we think otherwise, it says more about the small size of our imagination than it does about the size of God's power, because everything for him, and I mean literally everything, is infinitely easy. A lot of people today are very interested in the topic of animal rights. If animals are like humans and that they have afterlives, would that also mean they have rights like us? It wouldn't. Uh, as the Catechism says, we owe animals kindness since they're God's creatures, but that doesn't mean that they have the kind of rights that humans do. It's perfectly legitimate to use animals to meet human needs, such as by using them to perform labor or eating them or using them in other ways. We even see this happening in nature. For example, some species of ants actually farm aphids. They round them up, herd them to the food they need, protect them from predators, and then milk them of the honeydew that the aphids produce, which the ants then consume. And obviously, many animals eat other animals, like wolves eating sheep. So if it's legitimate for ants to farm aphids and drink their honeydew, it's legitimate for humans to farm cows and drink their milk. And if it's legitimate for wolves to eat sheep, then it's legitimate for humans to eat sheep, too. In fact, we'll have a link to an article that argues that if you love animals, you have a moral duty to eat them. All of these things are part of the natural order in this life, and there's nothing wrong with them. The next life may have a very different order of things, where wolves and lambs lie down together and lions eat straw, but that's the next life. 
right now we need to get through this one. And even if animals have an afterlife, they're not human beings and we shouldn't treat them like they are. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the question of do animals have an afterlife? The idea that animals don't have an afterlife has been a popular one in Christian theology. However, it isn't a teaching of the church that they don't, and I find the philosophical arguments that they don't have one unconvincing. By contrast, uh, many people in the world, including many Christians, have been of the opinion that animals do have an afterlife. This is partly based on their intuitions from having interacted with animals, including pets. But there are other forms of evidence, including reports of animal apparitions, and around a fifth of people who have had a near-death experience report seeing animals in the afterlife. There are even cases where the person comes back and has accurate knowledge he didn't previously have involving the animal he saw in the afterlife. So I think people need to be more open to the idea of animals having an afterlife than they often have been. In other words, I think the possibility of an animal afterlife is a live one. Pun intended. <laughs> Should always intend your puns. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer on the topic? We'll have a link to Edward Anderson's book, Evidence of Animal Afterlife, and Ed Akonowitz's book, Haunted Maryland, uh, which mentions the, the blue ghost dog. Also, Russell and Barnett's Ghost Dogs of the South and their book, Ghost Cats of the South, as well as C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, and Peter Kraft's book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Heaven. Then we'll have links to uh, the Baynet.com story on the blue dog, uh, an article on blue tick hounds so you can see what they look like, and also mastiffs, the 1965 cover by the birds of Turn, 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 that's the song based on Ecclesiastes 3, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, passage in the Summa Theologia on the soul, Joyce Salisbury's article, Do Animals Go to Heaven? Robert Sapolsky's talk on human uniqueness. Also information about theory of mind and theory of mind in animals. Edward Anderson's website and also his, uh, his blog post on my search results. And then Aquinas on the powers of different types of souls and also info about ants farming aphids. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this week? Well, I mentioned that we'd have an article uh, on the theme, If You Love Animals, It Is Your Moral Duty to Eat Them. And there is a case there because um, the fact that that we uh, breed animals, uh, that we f perform animal husbandry, that we breed animals to eat, means lots more of them get to live than if we weren't doing that. And so they are getting, yeah, maybe we eat them at the end, but, um, but they get a life out of that. And if it's a, so he doesn't praise factory farming, but if you're talking about humane conditions for the animals and they get a life out of it, even if they get eaten at the end, that's better than not having the life. Um, I will note that the author of this piece is, is a non-Christian. He seems to be an atheist, so he makes a few snarky remarks in there, but his arguments regarding animals are worth considering. Also, since we were talking about uh, near-death experiences in this episode, some people may recently have seen uh, different versions of an article online. Uh, one version of it was published in The Independent, which is a British newspaper. And the article was claiming that a recent uh, brain scan reveals that people's lives really do flash before their eyes as they're dying, just like it's reported in near-death experiences. Um, well, okay, uh, it would be interesting if brain scans confirmed that, on the one hand, that would conf that would provide additional documentation for one of the aspects of near-death experiences that is often reported, people having a life review. On the other hand, it would then be uh, used by skeptics to say, ah, see, this is just brain phenomena. Well, it wouldn't prove that. It would prove the brain is reflecting some of this experience, but it wouldn't prove the brain is causing this experience. But as it turns out, the whole article is a load of fetid dingo's kidneys. <laughs> um, the uh, it, it's 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 junk reporting based on a press release. 
and uh, the headline of the article is misleading, all kinds of stuff, and it's misleading. And the uh, the website Head Truth has a takedown of just how bad uh, the uh, the article was and why you should not regard this as remotely accurate. It's really astonishing when you when you read the takedown and he points out just all the flaws in the original article and just how wide the market is. Mm-hmm. Um, I would mention that Head Truth appears to be of the opinion that the mind is in no way dependent on the brain. And that's a position that Descartes would have liked. I personally... I'm not convinced of it, but regardless of whether you think the mind is somewhat dependent on the brain or not at all dependent on the brain, or regardless of what you think about the mind-brain connection, he's dead on in taking down this article that falsely claimed scientific studies have now documented a life review as, as you're in the process of dying. That's just not true. So much of news reporting on science uh, articles and science research, especially when it comes out of a press release from a scientist's paper, is is got to be taken with a grain of salt. So, yeah, I'm glad to see yeah. someone has taken that down. All right. So that does it from us this time. We would love to hear your theories about animals in the afterlife. Do all dogs go to heaven? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page or send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they've been doing on Mysterious World. Uh, If you haven't seen that yet, go by youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken and be sure and check out all the great work they've been doing to improve the video version of Mysterious World. And also, while you're there, uh, please do uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so that you get... uh, alerts whenever we have a new video. Uh, We just recently passed 25,000 subscribers on the channel, and I'm really trying to grow it. So I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. So, Jimmy, what is our next episode going to be about? Next week is a fifth Friday, so we're going to be answering weird questions about vampires and the blood of Christ, robots and the undead, demons and telepathy. Oh, so the normal thing. Good. Yeah, the normal <laughs> weird stuff. That's right. So remember, folks, remember to like this episode on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on Facebook, retweet it on Twitter, and get it out there so other people can enjoy this interesting discussion. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.